So way back in the before times, uh, back in 2006, I think, um, I had posed a brain teaser. Uh, a friend had asked me a question about whether a sailboat, he knew that a sailboat could travel faster than the wind uh, on, a, on a beam reach going across the wind, but he wondered whether it could uh, take a downwind course, say 45 degrees downwind, such that its downwind velocity component was faster than the wind. Um, and I worked out uh, some vectors and turns out it could. So I ended up deciding to pose a brain teaser to see if there was a way to do it uh, with a vehicle going directly downwind faster than the wind. And I, I posed that on a, uh, a couple of forums that I was active on. There was a kite surfing forum and a, uh, a radio control helicopter forum. Um, and I imagined that, you know, I would, I would post this brain teaser and, you know, we would kind of hash it over for a few days and people would sort of find it, uh, interesting and, you know, surprising that it was possible to go directly downwind faster than the wind at steady state. Um, what I did not imagine is that it would, uh, get a lot of traction or a lot of arguments. Uh, and I was completely wrong about that. It, it, it really kind of got away from itself and became a big fight across many, many forums and, uh, and, you know, it, there ended up being articles and such on it. Um, ultimately, Derek uh, Muller of Veritasium did a video on it, um, and I'll link that video in the description. In fact, uh, a, a UCLA professor uh, bet Derek $10,000 that it was a hoax, and this is, you know, many years after the fact, when it, it's very easy to to find the evidence online that it, that it worked. Um, but I opposed that just because I really enjoy brain teasers, um, and I always have. So recently, um, I've been thinking about another one. I've actually been thinking about it for probably, a, a, you know, two or three years, um, but it just seems a lot like that first brain teaser in some ways. It's very easy to pose, it's very easy to understand the problem, and in my opinion, the, the answer is surprising. Um, so I want to pose that uh, brain teaser today uh, and see if people have any response to it. Now, as it turns out, I don't really have a YouTube channel. Um, you know, I have the, the, the only uh, uh, subscribers I think I have came uh, over from Derek's site, uh, minus just a few, because I, I've always just used this channel really to share things with friends. When we're discussing things online, I'll put up videos and so forth. But uh, um, I'm hoping that this gets out at least enough to start a conversation. Um, and uh, like I said, I'll link um, the Derek video here. Um, there are a few YouTubers that I really would love to see uh, chime in on this. And I'm, I'm going to try, I'll, I'll put their uh, channels in the uh, description as well. Uh, these are some of my favorite uh, science YouTubers. Um, obviously, uh, Derek Muller, who I, I've mentioned. Uh, there's Tom Stanton has a channel. James Orville uh, has a channel. Um, it's called the Action Lab. Uh, Steve Mould uh, has a great channel. Matt Parker uh, also has a very good channel. I'm going to put links to, to all of their channels in the description. If nothing else, they're, it's, really, you, it's really worthwhile to go and, and check out their channels. Uh, but like I say, I'm, I'm hoping that I can get, uh, get one or more of them to chime in on this. Um, and by the way, maybe this is not a brain teaser at all. Maybe this is just a, a simple chemistry problem that you just solve the, you know, solve the problem and you get the answer and you go, well, there you go. Um, but of course, that's what I thought about the downwind cart as well. I thought, look, the, the analysis, uh, as counterintuitive as it is, the analysis for the downwind cart is extremely simple. And there are a few different ways to do it. You can take a vector approach. You can take an energy approach. You can take a force approach. Um, but in any event, they're, they really are simple. And they really do show that it just will go downwind faster than the wind. Uh, similarly, this is a fairly easy one to solve, I believe. Um, but like the downwind cart, Problem. I think it's got a counterintuitive uh, solution, and I'm, I'm curious to see if others find that to be the case or just find that uh, I'm a little too easy to follow. Uh, so if, if nothing else, these, uh, these YouTubers that I mentioned are going to just be thrilled that I'm bringing my enormous uh, crowd to expand their channels, you know. So I did a, uh, another, uh, actually 
uh, there were two more videos uh, with Derek uh, on Veritasium. One uh, was, I don't think I appeared in the second video, unless maybe he had uh, some some prior tape of me. That was probably the case. And that was the one where he was settling the bet with uh, Dr. Kosenko of UCLA, who had said that the Denwin vehicle is a hoax. And then we did one on how bicycles balance and steer, uh, because that's another one that um, it was really about counter steering. You know, people people tend to believe that counter steering is or can be used above a certain speed, but that it's typically not used uh, at low speed. And it's it's very very it feels very much that way. It does not feel like you're counter steering at low speed, but that is in fact how you balance a bike. Uh, it's what they call non minimum phase control. It's the same as balancing a a broomstick uh, on your hand. Um, where you, you have to move it one way initially to get it to lean the other way and then, and then move it that way. So I, I did those. I have recommended uh, this video to Derek, um, but, you know, obviously Derek has a ton of, of great ideas coming from who knows how many directions. Uh, so this one didn't spark his interest yet enough uh, to, to, to get him to take it up. Um, but, you know, again, hoping he may weigh in on this. He does have one video um, that I will later, when I post the answer to this, probably in a week or so, I'll post a new video to, to answer this brain teaser. Um, he has a video that I'm going to link that is very relevant to this, uh, and I think in a surprising way. Also, it, it may be that Derek uh, didn't feel the need to, to take on yet another uh, one of my goofy ideas, because if nothing else, a, a little Rick can go a long way. Another thing uh, I'm going to put in the description is a a link to a talk I gave at the St. Francis Yacht Club on the Dallin vehicle. Um, I've given a, a bunch of talks um, at NASA, Stanford, Google, uh, a whole bunch of different places on the Dallin cart. Usually what I talk about is sort of the history of it, how it came about and what we did. Um, but this was the second talk that I gave at St. Francis. When they invited me for a second time, I, I made them a deal that I would uh, be happy to do it again. But on the second talk, I really wanted to talk, talk about the physics of it, about how and why it works and, and describe in as intuitive a way as I could uh, how to understand why it does what it does, despite it being counterintuitive. Um, so I'll link that talk. And that one, I think that might be close to an hour of, of boring physics. If anyone cares to sit through it, uh, great. And if not, that probably makes even more sense. So the new brain teaser um, is about compressing air. Um, and I'll, I'll describe it uh, briefly. The notion is to take a, a fixed amount of air, fixed mass or volume of air at constant, or rather at, at uh, atmospheric pressure and atmospheric temperature, just, you know, regular, uh, regular old air and compress it, let's say 10 to one. So um, the way I want to pose it is that we, we start with a, a cylinder and a piston compressing the air so that it's, we, we just keep the same uh, actual molecules of air throughout the experiment. Um, and as an example, I'll just use this little bitty syringe. I wish I had a bigger one to, to use, but uh, I use these for glue. Um, so if I take, if I, I, I'm going to plug one end of this syringe and if I, if I compress it, you know, a couple things are going to happen. I'm going to get higher pressure air inside this uh, syringe, and it's going to be higher temperature when I compress it. Obviously, if I let go of the plunger, you know, it, it just comes back. It's sort of, it's a lot like a spring when I plug this end. So if I press, compress it by 10 to 1, um, and I do it fairly quickly. So we, we have what is basically an adiabatic compression of that air. In other words, uh, we either insulate the, the syringe or we just do it fast so that there's not a lot of heat lost to the environment as I compress it. So if I compress it in a second or two at 10 to 1, uh, pressure will go up, the temperature will go up, um, and then I will hold it, just hold the plunger at that 10 to 1 setting, and I'll let the excess temperature bleed off as heat. So I'll let it come back to atmospheric temperature um, over time. It can, you know, it doesn't matter if it takes an hour or a day or, or whatever. Um, but I, I compress it quickly in, a, you know, a second or two. I compress it 10 to 1 by volume. 
Uh, and then I just hold it and let the temperature come back to atmospheric temperature. The question then is, of the work that I used to compress it, how much of that energy or work is lost as heat when I allow it to come back to atmospheric temperature uh, or ambient temperature? Um, we know, of course, that I've compressed it 10 to 1, started at ambient pressure and temperature, uh, so one atmosphere. Um, it goes up to some higher temperature and pressure when it's compressed. And then when I let that temperature equalize to become ambient temperature again, um, I will lose some of that energy as heat. Uh, so ultimately, it starts and ends at the same temperature. And ultimately, it, it starts at one volume and ends at one-tenth of that volume. So we know that in the end, P1V1 equals P2V2. So we're going to have 10 times the pressure in one-tenth of the volume in the final cylinder. Uh, so we know, you know, that's the same as, as any compressor that they use in a garage or, or in a workshop that they can use to operate tools or a lift or something like that. So we know that that final uh, gas in that compressed cylinder or in that syringe can be used to do work. Um, and we know that it will be, after this experiment, we know that it will be at 10 atmospheres, 10 times the original pressure. Um, so again, just real quickly, take the, take the air, compress it 10 to 1 uh, quickly, then let that excess temperature or heat bleed off so that it comes back to ambient temperature. We're left with a gas at 10x pressure and ambient temperature in one-tenth the volume. How much of the energy used to compress it do I lose to that temperature, uh, to that heat loss? Um, so hopefully this reaches a few people. Um, hopefully some people might post their answers in the, uh, in the comments. Um, I'll probably respond to some of them. I don't think I'll give the answer, um, until I post the, the following, the follow-up video. And, and perhaps it'll be as simple as, you know, everyone answers this in the comments, uh, with the correct answer and says like, there's nothing surprising about this. That's just, you know, it's just a chemistry problem. Um, so, you know, please do, if you, if you find this interesting, please do comment, uh, come at me with as much, uh, evidence or, or intuition explanation, uh, as, as you like. Uh, but do keep in mind that uncle Rick is a big old thin skinned man, baby. Uh, so if comments are just plain insulting and abusive, I probably will just delete those. Um, and hopefully somebody finds this interesting and, uh, hopefully they post some answers. Uh, I'll post what I think is the answer in probably a week or so. Um, and we'll see you then.